Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest very exciting session of the Red IGC Environmental Economics course. Today, we're very pleased to have two very exciting speakers to speak on climate migration. Uh, Garrett Bryan, who is an associate professor in the Department of Economics um, at the London School of Economics, um, and Melanie Morton who is an uh, associate professor in the Department of Economics at Stanford University. Uh, Garrett and Melanie are world experts on this topic, very much uh, pursuing some of the most exciting work on the frontier of research on climate migration. So we're very pleased to welcome them. Um, but before I hand things over to them, let me uh, uh, make a few logistical uh, announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, we do have, if you are willing to turn on your video, and participate as a live participant, uh, please raise your hands and we'll randomly choose the first uh, among uh, uh, 20 folks from among the folks who raise their hands uh, in the next moment uh, to be live participants. That means you'll have your video on and you'll be able to ask questions uh, live uh, in this session. Um, so again, only if you are willing to have your video on uh, should you raise your hand to do that. But you can do that starting now and uh, we will let you in if you're randomly selected among 20. Um, also, anyone uh, who's participating in this session, whether you're live or not, is welcome to post questions pertaining to the lecture. Please do so in the Q&A, not the chat feature in Zoom. Uh, and please only post questions that pertain to the academic content of the lecture, uh, rather than logistical questions about the course. Um, hope folks will abide by that. Um, Finally, if you would like to access past lecture recordings and slides, uh, we, uh, please go to the website posted in the chat. Uh, you can see all the past lecture recordings and slides, and this lecture um, will be, uh, uh, a video link to this lecture will be put up on that website as well. So, without further ado, uh, please, uh, please welcome uh, Garrett Bryan and Melanie Morton. Please take it away. <laughs> Hi everyone. Well, thank you, Dean, uh, for the warm welcome. And also thank you uh, to Caleb and all of the BRID IGC team for all of the logistics. So it's wonderful to talk about this really important topic. And what we want to do today is give a sense of in which ways is climate change a spatial phenomenon? And because it's going to be a spatial phenomenon differentially affecting different locations, what do economists, what tools do economists have? And in particular, what tools in terms of spatial models do economists have to start to understand what we might think might be the adjustment uh, through migration and through other channels. So, uh, and I'm gonna show you a few uh, maps in a, in a moment, but basically when we think about climate change, I think the key thing we want to think about is it's going to have differential effects at both the country level. So for example, countries that are already very hot today are going to be even more impacted by climate change than countries that are further uh, away, uh, north or south. There's also going to be differences within a country so for example, if you're living on the coast, you may be differentially affected in terms of sea level rise. You may be differentially affected in terms of uh, exposure to different weather patterns. And it's also going to be a sectorial component. So for example, if you're somebody working in agriculture, you may be much more exposed to changes in rainfall and climatic shocks than somebody working in manufacture, manufacturing. And so as we think about folks maybe moving across sectors, moving across regions, potentially moving across countries, this means we really want to think about understanding what is the equilibrium process that happens so that we can understand who's going to move and then what's going to happen in both the places that they leave and the places that they go to. And here it's going to be a really important set of skills to think about both the direct effects so for example, there's a change in rainfall patterns and maybe that generates a permanent change in the agricultural productivity of a location. That change in the agricultural productivity might decrease earnings and that might mean that some people want to leave, but there may also be indirect effects. So for example, there's literature that shows that as income changes, violence or other uh, issues may increase, 
Increasing violence might be another reason that people then choose to move. So we want to think about both understanding direct effects and spillover effects. And those are gonna be both at the origin where people start from, and then all of these questions that we think about as people go. What happens if a whole lot of migrants start moving to cities in terms of wages? What happens to housing prices? How do all of these general equilibrium effects uh, work? And what, what other ones might we want to think about? So these are really the bread and butter of spatial models. So we're going to spend quite a lot today, uh, time today just talking through what would be a very basic spatial framework to start to think about uh, climate change. So here are a couple of figures just to give a sense of this um, spatial dimension. So these are um, figures from the Climate Impact Lab. The figure on the left shows the current temperature across the world. So what you can see there is sort of the standard dif uh, distribution. You know, this picture for those who want to know what per capita GDP looks like or any, any of those other uh, variables that move with income, education, health. This sort of map here is going to be basically the same map as you would have for any sort of uh, outcome variable. The first thing to note about climate change is that its impacts are gonna be differentially felt, but a lot of the places, and so the picture on the right is the change, the next predicted 20 year change in temperature. A lot of the places that are going to be most affected are going to be, for example, places in North Africa that are already very hot. So climate change is going to differentially affect different countries, and it's also going to differentially affect countries that today are already poorer than many other countries. If we zoom in a little bit, we can see this regional differences. So this is zooming into Southern Europe, Northern uh, Africa. And what you can see is even within the same country, there's going to be heterogeneity in what parts of the country are gonna be more affected by climate and what parts of the uh, country will be potentially less affected. And this is also really important because as we think about people moving, People might be moving from agriculture, rural areas to urban areas. They may be moving from countries that are poorer to countries that are richer. We really want to understand how all of these flows uh, happen. Are there going to be barriers that stop people moving? And then what do we think about understanding kind of the overall welfare effect uh, of, of these movements and what this means for whether or not people can adapt to climate change? In terms of thinking about how many climate migrants they're going to be, I think this is, um, you know, there's lots of work that's trying to get at ballpark numbers. I think this is sort of very much numbers up in the air. So for example, um, the World Bank um, had a recent report where they were trying to think about looking at predicted changes in climate, weather, temperature, and then thinking about how many people are likely to be displaced uh, in three parts of the world. So thinking about, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia and Latin America, the predictions are up to 3% of the population might need to move. That doesn't necessarily mean 3% of the population are gonna be moving to different countries. A lot of that change may potentially happen within country borders. So this is gonna be thinking about the impacts of this movement on urbanization, on structural change, and what do we think about both the within country or across sector reallocation as well as potentially uh, migration across country borders. However, I think the overall impact of how many people are going to be affected um, is sort of very much a question where we can predict it, but it's going to be a big unknown about the size of the actual shock. So what do we want to do today? We're gonna to start by talking about some of the existing empirical evidence. And I think this is important for sort of establishing that people have migrated in the past in response to climate shocks. However, we should think carefully about the external validity of comparing responses to climate shocks, where we think about those climate shocks happening basically in isolation, and then what we might think that would happen if there's going to be a much larger aggregate shock where much of the world gets affected at the same time. So thinking about that, um, we can sort of see that there's suggestive evidence that people are going to respond in terms of uh, shocks. We can then sort of try and think about the framework where we can look through a model to understand, you know, how might we start to predict where people are going to go from, where people are going to go to, and what frictions uh, there might be. So we'll step through a basic uh, spatial model just to give folks a sense of what the mechanisms are in that literature. 
And then I'm going to hand over to Garrett and Garrett's going to think about what, do, what are the implications of that spatial model? What do we need to know from the data to be able to start to think about some of the spillover effects? And then what might be some shortcomings with these models for answering policy relevant questions uh, right now? Okay, so what do we know from the existing literature? I think it's helpful to sort of think about a couple of different dimensions where folks have studied the impacts of migration responses to different types of climatic shocks. And here, I think you can think about sort of temporary shocks. So this might be this year, the monsoon rains arrive late. And so it's a temporary shock, but it's not necessarily a change from the long run expectation. There might be something that's a medium level shock. So here we could think about maybe earthquakes, hurricanes, where there's both a shock this period, perhaps there's damage. And so that means the shock is going to be more persistent. And then we could think really about these permanent shocks. So there I think is where climate change falls in. Historically, we could think about things like the great, the dust bowl in the US and the permanent change in agricultural conditions that generated a permanent shift uh, and the viability of that part of the US to be generating agriculture. And then in terms of what people do, there's sort of many different ways that people can migrate. You could migrate temporarily. So what does this mean? Temporarily migration, you go somewhere, you stay for a while, you come back. That might be an ex post uh, response to a temporary shock. You might do seasonal migration. So seasonal migration might is a little different than temporary migration in that it's usually repeated season after season. Um, however, it's also different than permanent migration in that people go and then come back. And permanent migration is, you know, when people tend to go, they move uh, and they're permanently or for several years living in a different location. So I want to just give a sense of where some of the literature falls in. This is not meant to be an exhaustive survey, but just what, what do we know from different papers that have used different uh, empirical strategies uh, to get at this? So in terms of thinking about temporary shocks and seasonal migration, we have the work of um, Garrett and Mushrig and uh, Shermo, where they're thinking about uh, responses to temporary incentives to migrate, generating seasonal migration, and it's a repeated seasonal migration, people keep migrating uh, after they've had that exposure. We can think about um, Rick Hornbeck's work on the Dust Bowl migrants. So here, this was a permanent shock to agriculture. Um, permanent in the sense that it was, is gonna be that in that way, similar to climate change. There will be one important difference. It wasn't a shock that happened to all of the United States at the same time. But we can think there about um, what happened to those migrants. They mostly led to permanent migration, moving out of the area and moving towards different uh, states in the US. Um, I have some work where I was looking at our temporary migration responses to short run climatic uh, shocks. So bad rainfall realizations push people into migrating. However, in that setting in rural India, people don't use temporary migration as a permanent strategy. They tend to migrate the years in which they need to and then not migrate the years in which they don't. So for example, you see a household migrating one year, the next year, only about half of those households that migrated last year migrate again. There's also, uh, so Dean has some really nice work. There's some really nice work in uh, Vietnam as well, which is thinking about what are the responses to kind of natural disasters. So thinking about hurricanes, thinking about typhoons, Again, these are shocks that come in, they generate damage now, and they potentially uh, are going to ge generate longer term damage through destroying capital, longer uh, issues with land quality. And there we see evidence that folks tend to migrate permanently, either within the country, uh, which is the Vietnamese paper, or thinking about migrating, for example, to the US. And so that's a permanent type of migration across country borders. We can also think about whether or not temporary rainfall shocks lead to permanent migration. And here are a couple of examples from China and from Indonesia, where people have temporary rainfall shocks that nudge them into becoming permanent rural to urban migrants. And so again, there's gonna be a lot of variation in terms of what sort of responses people have, and then how we think about mapping this empirical evidence to what we might think about in terms of responses to climate change. 
And sort of as I've been mentioning, you know, there's very much a spatial dimension to thinking about migration. We might think that rural households are going to be the most exposed, though that's not only true. For example, a lot of urban areas like Jakarta, there's going to be a lecture in a couple of weeks on sea, sea level rise. A lot of cities are also very populated and may be directly affected by climate change. But if you are, for example, in a rural area and your rainfall patterns change, which changes the profitability of being a farmer, you might have a choice to move to another rural area. You might have a choice to move to another urban, to an urban area. You may be moving abroad. And this migration or climate-induced migration potentially then has broader implications for what the pattern of location is inside the country, what we think about structural change, and then also what we think about welfare. If people are moving out of locations that are more exposed or more risky, they may be moving to cities where income gains might be 30% higher. That might be an important component of what happens in terms of welfare when we want to understand the net effects of climate change. And again, I think another really important thing is, you know, this is a different world or thinking about climate is a really different world than thinking about isolated, temporary or more permanent, but isolated geographically shocks. So a lot of that evidence that I just talked about looks at, and part of the way you can identify these shocks is that you can look at relative changes for a place that was more affected compared with a place that was less affected. So if it's the case that there's no relative change or there's a big level shifter, everyone is affected, some places are affected more and than less, lots of these strategies are going to only be able to pick up perhaps one component of what's happening. They'll be able to pick up the relative piece, but not the level effect that's affecting everyone. And so what happens and how relevant are these empirical uh, estimates when a climate shock is hitting many people at the same time? What happens in terms of things like insurance or informal insurance where you may not have other friends or other family members who are unaffected who can help your family recover if other people are also going through the same thing. And this, I think, is also where our um, thinking carefully about different GE channels is going to be really important. OK, so let me step through what would be a basic framework here. I don't want to give a fully endogenous uh, spatial model. You can. Um, you can read those, I've got a few references, but I wanna just step through something that gives you the intuition of what a spatial adjustment process looks like. So we'll do that. We'll start with a simple case of just two locations, and then I'll show you how there's a few tricks to extend that up to N locations. And then how do economists start to endogenize prices like having wages, having housing prices adjusted, maybe having cost of living through trade adjust. Okay, and so, you know, this is kind of the toolkit to think about spatial equilibrium. So people choose in these models where to live based on what the benefits are of being in the place and maybe what the costs or the opportunities to move elsewhere are. And when we think about benefits, we don't think just about wages, although that might be an important piece. There's also going to be, for example, the amenity value, how much you like a location, it's going to be the cost of living, that might be the cost of housing, or it might be the cost of buying food. So there's going to be a whole bundle of um, attributes of a location that will together affect where a person wants to live. And so when there's a shock to the system, people might want to change location. That's going to be possible if it's not too costly to move. And then we want to think about what might happen in terms of adjustment. You know, do house prices go up? Do wages fall? Do amenities endogenously change if the, the city gets more crowded or more polluted? And how do we think about those channels feeding back into the decision? It's in the, and it's a really natural place to start thinking about climate shocks. Climate shocks may have a direct productivity effect. They may have a direct amenity effect. We can sort of think about mapping in climate into different uh, parts in the model. Okay, so let's just start to set ideas. Super simple example, two locations. And let's say all we care about is how much we earn, how much we have to pay for our housing, how nice the location is. So wages, rents, amenities. What you'll start to notice in a lot of these models is there's also this epsilon term, and that is an idiosyncratic shock. So for example, I really like the beach, 
Um, so I might, everyone might really like the beach living in California. I might particularly like the beach. And so I might have a particularly high idiosyncratic drawer for California that might make me different than someone like Garrett, who given he chose to live in London, probably likes the beach less and maybe likes going out for fancy dinner uh, more. So this epsilon shock is gonna be something that is different across people. Sometimes this epsilon shock is just my preference. Sometimes it might be something else, like I'm better at the sorts of work that happen in San Francisco, or I'm better at the sorts of work that happen in London. And we can then start to think about models of selection and sorting. But basically these models work where there's a piece that's common to everyone. So everyone agrees that California has a baseline amenity value. The baseline model of these models, everyone earns the same amount, pays the same amount in cost of living. So there's something, this VA term that's common to California. And then I might have a low or high draw for California that makes me happier or less happy to live there. And the same thing for location B. So what does it look like? People have different realizations. So I have some preference for London, some preference for living in San Francisco. This might, one of these dots is me, one of these other dots is Garrett. Who chooses to live where? You live if, uh, in location A, if your value of your idiosyncratic shock is bigger than sort of the difference in the agreed value, this is the VB minus VA, and the difference in the other shock. So basically, I live in California if I'm happier to live in California than living in London. And you can just rearrange this equation to make that in terms of the shock. Why is that helpful? It's helpful because we can just draw a line, the VB minus VA. And then it just means that everyone who has a high realization of the San Francisco shock, living in A, these people up here, they move to San Francisco. Everyone who has a relatively high realization of the shock in London, the people down here, and B, they move to London. And that's gonna be kind of this idea where not everyone's the same. And that's gonna be important because if everyone was the same, these models tend to have a prediction that all utility is the same. We think more realistically, not everyone's going to move because people are different. And this is just one way of capturing uh, that idea. Okay, so this is basically the idea. And then we can sort of go a little bit further and we can say, okay, so how many people end up living in California? in San Francisco, how many people end up living in London? And then what happens if San Francisco becomes nicer? How many people are gonna move in? And so the main thing you need to do to go from this to starting to get predictions <coughs> is you just need to make some assumption about what these error terms are. So I'm gonna make one assumption on the next slide that is really simple, just that the difference between my shock for San Francisco and London is uniformly distributed. But when you want to start scaling up, you make slightly different assumptions on these error terms. And that's kind of how you get to like a fully specified model. But let me step you through a simple case and then I'll just show you uh, where to go for the more complicated cases. Okay, so I wanna live in London. I wanna live in, sorry, I wanna live in San Francisco. San Francisco is A. If my value of being in San Francisco is bigger than my value of being in London, let's B. So we can write that I choose to live in San Francisco as a function of whether or not my gap in the shocks is bigger or smaller than the gap in the indirect utility. Okay, and then we just wanna say what share of the population, given our assumption on those, that shock distribution are going to have preferences that mean that they wanna move and live in, uh, in A in San Francisco. Okay, here what I did is I just made an, an assumption that there's a uniform distribution with support S, um, and so because the uniform distributions are really easy to work with, what that means is that we just get this closed form prediction that half the people are going to live in A and then a little, if A is nicer than B, more people will live in A. And we have this S on the denominator. And so the way to think about the S is it's sort of saying something about how different people are. So for example, if S, the support of the uniform distribution is really large, that means there's always gonna be someone out there who loves London no matter what happens to the wages in London. They really wanna to go to great theater. And so they're going to not, they're gonna be very reluctant to move to San Francisco, even if wages in San Francisco go up. So this is sort of a sense of like, how important is the heterogeneity across people? And so what this equation here is just saying is that if A and B were exactly the same, 
then we'd have half the people living in each. If A is better than B, so if San Francisco has better wages, rents, and amenities, we'll have more than half the people, but it's very unlikely we're ever gonna have 100% of the people living in San Francisco because there's some people who have a realization of the idiosyncratic shock. They love London so much that they won't move. So this S is gonna be sort of a key parameter in a lot of these models because it sort of tells you a little bit about how sticky people are or how responsive they are to migration. This model is sort of immediate to think about the case of migration costs. So if it's costly to move to B to, from B to A, instead of just getting A minus B, if you move, you have to pay a migration cost, the tau. And so that's going to mean that not as many people move from B to A because they have to pay the tau. And so that's going to be just a really natural way to extend the model. OK, and so that's the basic idea. And this is just a simple two case. If you wanted to go and say like, okay, there's more than two locations, there's X number of regions in my country, or there's X number of countries in the world. What you can do is just make a slightly different assumption on those error terms. And then you can sort of use this extreme value, these Frisch or logit tricks to get closed form solutions. And so that's where a lot of the benefit of making some functional form assumptions come from. So if it's the case that you just are willing to assume logit shocks or gumbo shocks, you get this very common uh, logit expression for migration flows. You'll sometimes see, especially in the trade literature, for Shea shocks, this like um, just this one of the gumbo shock is the log of the for Shea shock. You get a slightly different closed form for the share of people who want to live. So that's kind of basically all the models do. So that gives you predictions on how many people are going to move. It also gives you a way to think about what happens if some component of V changes, for example, because of changes in productivity, how many people are gonna move? And then if we think a little bit about what we think happens to the equilibrium determination of wages or of housing prices, we'll be able to get the whole feedback loop. Okay, so the economics is, is the same for the N case as, as the two person case. So let's just sort of step through that. So the model now was just thinking about exogenous prices. That means that the only thing that's causing people to sort into one location is people who really like theater versus people who really like the beach. And then the sort of first model that you might hear about is the rosen roback model. And what this model dot did was the first one to think about having endogenous house prices. So what this means is that as more people move to San Francisco, the cost of living in San Francisco goes up. San Francisco becomes a little less attractive. And so not everyone who wanted to move actually wants to move with the higher rents. Okay. And so this is the way that we can start introducing these GE effects. So there's a productivity shock in San Francisco. Wages go up in San Francisco. Holding cost of living constant. Lots of people want to move there. If lots of people move to San Francisco, rents go up. Or we could think about like, Lots of people move to San Francisco, traffic goes up, congestion goes down, that makes it less nice to live in. Because house prices have gone up, not as many people actually want to move. And so we get an equilibrium through also endogenous prices. Okay. If you're interested, there's a couple of um, this Moretti handbook is a handbook um, that goes through the Rosen Robot model. The Redding and Rossi Hansberg, it's basically the same framework, but you can think about incorporating trade frictions and other frictions. Um, and so that's a version that has uh, that model. And so let me just sort of show that graphically on a couple of demand, uh, labor and housing market curves. And then I'm gonna hand over to Garrett um, to talk about what we learn from this model in terms of frictions for climate change, okay? So here, imagine this is the model, the market for San Francisco. In the labor market, there's demand, labor demand, labor supply. In the housing market, there's housing demand, housing supply. San Francisco gets more attractive, labor demand goes up. So we would normally expect an increase in the number of people who are in San Francisco. That increase in the number of people who are in San Francisco would lead to an increase in housing demand in San Francisco. That would increase rents. And then I haven't drawn all of the loops, but you can imagine as rents go up, what that means is that labor supply decreases because this is all holding things constant. Labor supply decreases, that would reduce a little bit the number of people, and then that would reduce a little bit the housing demand. So you can see that you can 
go back one and forward and sort of iterate until you get to a close point where no one actually who's not living in San Francisco wants to move there and no one who's in San Francisco wants to move. There. Okay, so that's the basic uh, spatial model. And let me hand over now to Garrett, who's gonna talk about what we take from that to think about the specific frictions uh, for climate change. Thanks for that introduction, Melanie. And just while I try and get my screen to show, let me clarify that the reason I live in London is because my deep love for just very, very small amounts of rain, which we call drizzle, which is what's happening outside at the moment. Okay, so it falls to me to talk about the model predictions. What do we get out of these models when we calibrate them with real world data and how do we do that? And what are the problems with the models? They're not perfect, obviously, yet. And where should we go next? And in line with what Melanie said, our whole goal here is to move towards more external validity. We want to use the models to try to understand or predict what's gonna happen when we have climate change, a very large scale event, the like of which really we don't see in existing data. Okay. So I could use my model that Melanie has outlined so nicely in many different ways and to answer many different questions. And here are just three that I think are interesting that I'm going to talk about. We could ask with the model, for example, how many migrants should we expect and where should we expect them to go? We could then ask what would be the welfare impact of climate change once we account for the fact that people might be able to move out of harm's way, leave those places that are flooded or leave those places that are very hot. We could also ask, how does that welfare impact depend on constraints on migration? Let's suppose we were to close borders and stop people moving. Would that massively exacerbate the problem of climate change? Or is migration not really a key adaptation mechanism? Now, if we want to answer these questions, we have to estimate key parameters of our models. That means changing very vague ideas into specific elasticities and finding data to estimate. So for example, we would like to know how many people will leave affected areas. And a key input in that is the elasticity of migration to productivity changes. And I might be able to estimate that parameter. I might also want to know what will happen to productivity at the destination where migrants move to. That would be the elasticity of pro productivity to population, and I could try to estimate that. Or finally, I might want to know, for example, what will happen to amenity at the destination. That's the elasticity of amenity to population. These last two are congestion questions. As people move into destinations, those destinations become more congested, what should we expect will happen? And they're going to be key to the claim I'm going to make, which is we're not quite at full external validity with our models. I don't think they're necessarily capturing what we should think will happen. But if I have those parameters, then I can simulate based on climate scientists' predictions of physical impacts. So for example, climate science tends to suggest the rural areas in the southeast of Bangladesh are going to see a large drop in productivity. That's equivalent to a drop in the V of that location in Melanie's model, and people will tend to move. How many will move is determined by the shock that Melanie talked about earlier. Okay. I think it's very important to get a taste for how we estimate these parameters in order to understand what the models are actually talking about. And so I'm just going to pick on one particular elasticity, which is the elasticity of congestion to population. So when people migrate into a location, it's plausible that they create congestion. For example, many people in London means there's less space to move around or perhaps more communication of communicable diseases as we're all trying to forget. I want to point out that this congestion is policy dependent. It is a choice, not a fact about the world, but we still want to try to estimate it in data. The way we would do this is something like this. 
I have this equation here. I don't know whether you can see it. And this says the amenity at location L is equal to some baseline amenity of the location. San Francisco is beautiful and has a nice bay. So it is a high natural amenity. London is drizzly and next to a polluted river, it has a low natural amenity. But then as more people move in, that increases congestion. And we might be concerned that that lowers the amenity further. Taking logs and putting in an error term, we get then an equation that looks like this. And we could in principle estimate this equation to find out the key parameter lambda here. Lambda is what we want to know, the elasticity of amenity population. How do we do that? Well, there are two broad steps to estimate lambda in the literature usually. First of all, amenity is something that urban economists made up. So we need a way to measure it. It doesn't float free form above a city. We do it as follows. We treat a, an amenity as a residual. That is, I say, well, there are lots of people living in L, but the wages are low and the rents are high. So what accounts for their choice to live there? Well, it must be the amenity in location L is high. And I could use data, therefore, to estimate amenities across different places. I will also have some reverse causality problems in my equation, and that's going to require an instrument for the population. It's popular to use some measure of productivity, but we won't go into it too much. But now I'm off to the races to try and use data to estimate lambda. If you do this in the United States, for example, using a cross section of data at the I forget, metropolitan area, you get something like lambda equals 0.32. That is the elasticity of amenity to population is minus 0.32. As a location gets crowded, the amenity goes down. How should we read this? Well, what does this really mean given the, the instrument and my functional form and my measure of, of amenity? Well, it says that high productivity places in the United States tend to have more people but not quite as many as you might expect. Hence, they seem to have low amenity. And I want to point out that this uses a cross section of data in the United States, and it is a very long run parameter based on the slow movement of people across space in the United States, not in response to a major crisis. So that's the type of way we get parameters here. Okay. There are additional other important parameters, and let me tell you a little bit how you get them. I would need to know the spatial distribution of productivity and amenity. I usually get them by rationalizing wages and location choices that I observe in data within my model. I'd like to have measure costs of migration. And as Melanie pointed out, these just rationalize home bias. People born in location A are much more likely to stay in location A than to move to location B. And people born in location B are much more likely to move, stay in location B to, to move to location A. So that would give me migration costs. There are other key congestion parameters, which is what I'm concerned about. They are, for example, the elasticity of production to population and the elasticity of migration costs with respect to the number of migrants. This first one we estimate very similar to how I just told you how we estimate lambda. The second we assume to be zero. The number of migrants does not determine the cost of migration. And that would seem to be appropriate for a very long run model of the distribution of people across space. Okay, so what does this mean? Because we're taking all our parameters from very long run data with low migration rate, it means we are in effect asking, what would be the impact of climate change if the large permanent change that's created by climate change leaves the parameters of the model unaffected? Okay. So that's what we're asking and that's how we do it. What do we get if we do this? These are results from a very recent paper by Cruz and Rossi Hansberg, and they're kind of representative of what you find in the later. This model is much more complicated than what Melanie presented but it's in the same spirit. So here's what they suggest. If we look at warming alone under one of the more extreme but plausible climate scenarios, world welfare will decrease by 
half a billion people will be displaced. And if migration costs increase by 25%, the welfare loss will rise to 9%. Climate change is going to be bad. It's going to displace a lot of people. But if we stop those people from moving, it'll be even worse. The map on the right shows the percentage change in population predicted because of migration. And these red areas are seeing something like 50% increases in their population. And so that's a very large increase in population in those areas is predicted by the model. Okay. I'll change my screen. Okay. Now, takeaway. Migration is essential for keeping losses low, and there needs to be a lot of it in order to keep losses low. How do I see the models, though? I see this 6% as an aspirational best case scenario. The model is very smooth and parameters are taken from the long run. So this is how things might look if we play our migration cards well and we control the congestion effects of half a billion people trying to move across the world. This means welcoming migrants, building public goods in cities, etc. And it may even mean managing the timing and distribution of migrants across space. But as noted earlier, climate change is this very large, permanent large scale shock. It's migration on a historically large scale. It's not clear that the parameters I've used in the model are correct. And it's not clear that people will respond to smooth the congestion effects of migration across space. But we're in search of external validity. We want to predict what will happen when we have this unprecedentedly large shock. And it's very hard for economists with their usual tools, which are inherently backward looking, to make these predictions. So I'm going to look at some unusual data to try and make some predictions on what's going to happen. And I'm going to try to look at worst case scenarios. Now, one of my favorite people in the entire world is Isaac Asimov. And he argues that science fiction writers go forth into the future to try to predict what will happen. And they come back with data. One of the earliest science fiction writers is H.G. Wells. And he wrote this lovely book, The World of the Worlds. Some data visualization here is provided by Tom Cruise to see what will happen when large numbers of people try to move across space. Hopefully this will work. So this is the War of the Worlds behind you, everyone, as you may be able to see, are some aliens who are invading. They're a metaphor for climate change. People have been funneled onto a very, very narrow bridge where there is a sudden increase in congestion. They are starting to fight amongst themselves. Tom Cruise is in it. <laughs> Tom fights his way onto, the, onto a boat, pulling himself out of harm's way, and the military closes the bridge, pulling up the drawbridge behind. As it might not surprise you to realize, the people left behind die in the process of trying to get away from climate change. We're left seeing those people falling off, trying to jump to the bridge. So why show you this in terms of worst case scenarios? I want four points. The real damages and deaths from migration occur at pinch points. Migration causes congestion at destinations and on the paths of migration. And these are the potential real human costs of climate change. The second point. We will behave the same way as the military in this video, and we will close borders, and we will uh, create refugee camps, and we will criminalize travel across space. And this will further increase congestion on the places where migrants can get to and on the paths they choose to use. Third, migration cannot realistically be stopped. We can think about a scenario where migration costs are infinite, but people will still try to move away from negatively affected areas. 
And if they do that, they will be in harm's way. Finally, if you put the video forward, as is appropriate given morality standards from Hollywood, the people who pulled up the bridge all die. Because morally, it doesn't matter which side of the bridge you are on, you all lose when a lot of humans die in that situation. So that to me is the worst case scenario and the thing we have to avoid. So we've got a best case scenario, 6%. And we've got a worst case scenario. And I don't know which is right, but I worry about the worst case scenario. So that's a very unusual piece of data to try and get some external validity. Let me try and work back to suggest that lots of these things are things that we know happen. In the intermediate is what do we know is happening now with not very many migrants? On the left hand side is a boat that capsized, killing nearly presumed to be 500 people near Messenia in Greece while the Post Guard stood and watched. On the right-hand side is data from missing migrants, and they tried to put together data on how many people die every year or go missing, migrating illegally, illegally. You can see this is the Mediterranean. It's around two to 3,000 people go missing every year. These people are not stopped from migrating just because we've tried to push up the costs of migration. That means that since 2014, 22,414 people have died or gone missing trying to cross the Mediterranean. This is the data for the Americas. It's slightly lower, but nowhere near great. In total since 2014, 4,805 people are known to be missing or dead crossing from the US, from, that, from Mexico to US. These are likely to be underestimates of deaths. A slightly less controversial source of data to get some external validity is economists have started trying to study long run large scale migration events and refugee shocks. And these are small scale still in, res in, in respect of what we might expect from climate migration. But here are some results of a growing literature that I think suggest that the worst case scenario is plausible. First, rapid population growth followed the epidemiological transition, which lowered death rates, but did nothing to lower birth rates. Achimoglu, Ferguson and Johnson show that this rapid population growth leads to a large increase in conflict between people. So, to be clear what I'm saying, as populations grow in destination countries, this paper suggests one of the outcomes will be conflict. It's not the only paper to show that, it's one. The second, Dustman et al. study refugee arrivals in Denmark, and they show that when you have a large number of refugee arrivals in Denmark, those places that are traditional places for refugees to go to see a large increase in right-wing voting. We assume that that right-wing voting is against, again, an equivalent to pulling up the drawbridge or to funneling refugees into refugee camps, further increasing congestion. We also have evidence from Vis Taraz and her co-authors that climate change may even stop the migration that we hope will fix part of the problem, because if you get so poor, you may end up being trapped in agriculture. Finally, this amazing paper in India by some political scientists shows that when asked to help someone, local politicians in India are significantly less likely to offer help if that person is a migrant even if that person is from just another part of India. So this is not crossing international borders. This is just you are known not to come from the city. So all of these are representative of a growing literature that suggests that these congestion effects, which we should probably predict will be an outcome of climate change, are going to have the negative impacts that we worry about. So where then next and what's a more positive view on what might happen here? Okay, I really can't use this. So 
we have a worst case scenario. To my mind, I don't know whether it's going to happen, but it seems plausible that there will be large congestion effects and negative political economy responses to half a billion people trying to move across the world. But we have this optimistic just 6% welfare drop. So the question is, how do we design policy to get from the worst case to the best case? And that involves trying to smooth out the congestion effects that I've been talking about. Here are just four papers on what I hope will be a large literature fairly soon. First of all, house prices rise when refugees arrive. Rising house prices are a considerable source of congestion and unhappiness for existing populations, host populations. Rosso and uh, Sviacci show that this effect only occurs when you have an inelastic supply of housing, i.e. building public housing or its equivalent reduces the impact of in-migration on native populations and potentially uh, some of the political economy effects. Second, the more flexible is a labor market, the more it can do to help migrants integrate and get jobs when they arrive. It's unclear what this does to the existing populations, but I'll return to that in a second. Third, this is work in progress by Sandra Sakira and others but they show that social cohesion between refugees and their host communities is improved when a cash transfer is given, not just to the refugees, but also to their host communities. So Jonathan Colmer says, easily adjustable labor markets allow refugees to seek help when they're responding to climate change, and this paper then says, well, if the wages drop for locals, that can be compensated through cash transfers or perhaps other programs, leading to less negative impacts. Finally, I want to give a shout out to really interesting recent work looking at how to design mechanisms to allocate refugees more efficiently across space. This is by Scott Commoners and, and co-authors, and they're trying to find mechanisms whereby refugees can express the locations where they would like to go, and countries can express preferences for where they would like migrants to go, and how we can then better allocate migrants across space to try to avoid some of the congestion effects that I've thought of. I think this is just a small part of what is a beginning literature that's trying to understand how we minimize the congestion effects of the potential coming large scale climate migration. Okay, so some conclusions. Migration could play a huge role in adapting to climate change. I think what Melanie has explained to us theory why it should work and the predictions from the model I've shown suggest it could be extremely important. And I want to highlight something that we haven't said, but I think is true. It could be a triple benefit. Migrants move, that allows them to adapt. They move into dense, they move into denser city environments where they know that it is plausible that they have lower emissions. There are mitigation benefits. And finally, in those denser locations, they become richer because cities are often places where we have higher productivity. So there's the potential for this triple benefit. But I don't think it's necessarily going to have that triple benefit by itself. So the goal of the climate migration literature should be, in my opinion, to identify, test and perfect policies that help to smooth migrants' pathways through migration and their landings in their destination in order to keep the damages from climate change as low as possible. And I think this is a very large but incredibly important challenge. And it would be nice if some people on this call would help us, graduate students, people in policy, undergraduates who want to study this area. That's all I have, so thank you very much.
Brilliant. Thanks so much, Garrett and Melanie. Um, is Sarah nearby, Garrett? Yes, she is. Wonderful. Larry. You are now introduced. Okay. Move this lower. I think Melanie is going to help you as well. Oh, yay. Okay. Awesome. Question. So Sarah is going to uh, kind of manage the Q&A session here. Um, as a reminder, if you have a question, please put it into the chat and upvote other questions that you'd like to be covered. Um, we'll start with any of the live participants. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And we'll take one or two of those, um, and then we'll go to the ones in the chat. Yes, I see we have one here. Um, Mabubul Hassan Sharan. Do you want to start? And then we'll take a question uh, from Manoranjan Ghosh, and then uh, Sarah and Melody can answer the two together. Hi, uh, am I audible? Okay, so wonderful session, thank you. Um, so my question is with rapid urbanization, uh, like building infrastructures and uh, these reasons, with increased salinity, the cultivable lands in countries like Bangladesh is already declining. So if, um, according to the later part of the discussion, if migration is eased, so the if the overall production, agricultural production declines, uh, would there, wouldn't there be an added burden for already import-oriented countries like Bangladesh? Because Bangladesh uh, imports a huge proportion of the agriculture products like food grains and stuff. So if uh, my question is, if it would most likely create an added burden for import-oriented countries like Bangladesh, and if it does, how can that be uh, included in this uh, policy designing or uh, mechanism to address these issues? Thank you. Are we gonna take, sorry, Caleb, are we taking both at the same time and then responding or sequentially? Um, it's up to you. Typically, we take a couple and then answer together. Okay. Dr. Ranjan, would you want to ask yours? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so my question is related to the uh, climate immobility because currently I'm working on the, the climate migrations and climate immobility in the Indian subcontinent in a large scale spatial. I want to see the, the speciality of it, but what in the in my field observation, because I don't want to do the uh, only the secondary data analysis and the climate models, uh, because in the climate model, there is a lot of black box are there, which is not clear. And so what we found is uh, that so climate is changing and the people in the South Asia, particularly. So I observed in the again in the Bengal Delta. So people actually, they are adapting with that climate change and there is a lot of international aids and the governments, uh, the welfare policies are there, which are actually uh, in other way helping these households and helping the peoples uh, to stay in that particular change because there is a new policy debate is depopulating the geography or the particular geography is not a suitable idea. So that's because of that, I mean, the welfare policy and the government initiative, sometimes people have that attachment with the place and they're living and living against the, the geography where, which is which is very much vulnerable or it's a risk prone. Uh, so my Sorry, question is basically uh, whether the uh, whether the migrants are actually the climate migrants or the migrants are basically are the economic migrants or the people due to the aspiration they are living. So can you say that the climate migrants or the climate refugee, what would be the suitable word for that? All right. Melody, do you want to respond first or, or should I? Yeah, I think we also didn't introduce Sarah. Um, so Sarah is a <laughs> graduate student at LIC who's working exactly on these issues. So um, yeah, Sarah, why don't you take a, why don't you talk a little bit about these and I can jump in after. Yeah, sure. So um, Manaran, Jan, uh, I actually have a so a um, very exciting project of mine that's looking at this sort of thing of like, when do people migrate? I think it's very hard. I mean, migration decisions are very complicated. And so it's hard 
uh, even today, when you ask people around perceptions of migration, they may cite deteriorating climate, but they really, you know, are citing a whole litany of issues. And primarily, it'll be something like, uh, you know, the, the economic conditions in the place that they left were no longer tenable. So yeah, in a sense, it's economic migration, because they can't live in their, their uh, location of origin, because it's no longer economically feasible. But often, because these are agrarian areas and rural uh, parts of the world, then what's happening really the mechanism is climate, right? So even if the migrant themselves don't fully recognize that the climate change and the these projections are what's creating the drought that they're enduring, I think, you know, if you look at what is impacting rural agricultural productivity, it is climate. So I think I guess it depends, like, I guess for policy sake, and I'm not a political economy person, I, I get the framing matters, but I think at the end of the day, um, people are going to be migrating to cities because of economic need for economic opportunities that's being driven by climate change. I hope that kind of gets at your question. I don't know if there is a best way to label these people. Um, I think that's, again, more of a political economy question. Um, but I could, let me just jump in a little bit and add something there. So I think one thing you also talked about was, for example, maybe international aid or redistribution from the national government. And so the way that you would think about just incorporating that in the model, we had that indirect utility. So wages, amenities, rents, you could just put another term in there, like transfers from either international or national. And so, for example, a big transfer to a rural area that's going to make uh, the value of being in the rural area go up. That would be the way that the model would then rationalize fewer people moving out. However, and I also sort of agree with Sarah, like in some sense it's immaterial what people think is the reason for migrating. If you see that there's a bad rainfall shock and 10% of people move out, we can say like that rainfall shock is then leading to people move out. The sorts of people who move out probably will be the ones who go first, will be the ones in most frameworks who are least suited to agriculture. So there would be a little bit of selection there. But there's something that shifted them from being in the rural area to not being in the rural area. The ones who are most productive at agriculture and lots of frameworks would stay behind and migrate last. And so you sort of have potentially this other channel where the more productive agriculture people are the ones who stay behind longer. And so you might have changes in product productivity at the origin through that channel as well. Yeah. Right. A very good question. Yeah. Um, and I don't. Oh, um, and then the other question, which was around like Bangladesh and salination and, and uh, productivity and how this impacts imports and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I mean, I think import intensive countries are going to bear this proportionate uh, cost to climate um, change. I think Garrett and Melanie have made a lot of points that there is extreme spatial heterogeneity and there are going to be countries that really suffer more than others. I think Bangladesh is on the frontier of, of the climate crisis already with salination and declining agricultural lands. Um, I wish I had like a better answer of like what was, what, uh, you know, it, to, I mean, to mitigate this, I guess things like transfers, as Melanie said, um, facilitating migration, um, you know, if you can get people to move away from agriculture, so structural transformation into manufacturing and services, um, that kind of, releases the burden of having your a large share of your population working in agriculture, especially if agriculture is the most vulnerable, as we know, to climate shocks. Um, but I think that that, you know, then you have, you also have to weigh the things like congestion costs uh, of ur urbanization. I know DACA has grown it normally, enormously in the few, past few years uh, in response to having all of these migrants from rural areas that no longer see their, their old economic activities as, as viable. So I think there's a lot of trade-offs and uh, maybe Garrett painted too negative a picture that's now framed in my mind that <laughs> they're, you know, we're at the end of the war of the world. Um, but I think that, you know, there, I think that, you know, spatially we're looking, you know, Rossi Hannesburg looks at the globe, right, and says 6% welfare. I think that that is definitely masking a lot of this heterogeneity that you're, you're identifying very correctly. And another thing to um, just to add to that is like when we think about these really big macro models, so for example, climate change is going to reduce agricultural productivity in Bangladesh, but climate change is going to increase agricultural productivity in somewhere like Russia. And so for the terms of food security, food supply globally, um, there's going to be redistribution from places that might be producing agriculture today to places today. 
that are not necessarily producing agriculture, but maybe will start to or will become better at it. And so I think part of the question, answer to your question is also thinking about international trade. So whether or not Bangladesh starts to import more, what does that mean cost prices go up or go down? It depends a little. If it's now more productive to produce that grain in Russia, it's potentially that food prices could be lower depending on transportation costs and depending on the change in productivity. So these really big spatial GE models tend to have trade margins as well. And so they can also capture both the uh, adaption through individuals moving, but then also thinking about what happens globally, you know, what happens in terms of like global international trade with things like grain and food prices. And so that may be one channel which would provide some mitigation if it's the case that globally production costs go down somewhere else and some of that can get passed through. Great, thank you. Um, we'll take a few questions from the Q&A box now. Um, there's one on climate degradation versus climate shocks and um, how can we measure migration as a result of climate degradation, which is to say less productive coffee, coffee crops uh, are perhaps due to hotter and longer seasons rather than a climate shock. And then there's another question about, are we seeing any effects or relationship related to the ongoing youth bulges in the countries that are likely to be affected most by climate change? Um, if you guys want to touch on either of those. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about land degradation versus um, climate shock. So I think what I mean, I, so I guess, you know, it depends how you define a shock. Um, as economists, we're saying anything that affects agricultural productivity would be a shock and most likely driven by climate. Um, I think, you know, if you're thinking about massive disruptions like flood, massive floods, um, hurricanes, these sorts of shocks that are, as, as Melanie described, um, the medium type of shock where if it's going to be a massive, um, you know, upheaval, then I think, you know, that's going to create people who don't have a choice on a margin over time, right? Like they have to immediately respond to the crisis at hand. Um, whereas land degradation and some of these um, longer horizon variables like, you know, temperature trends and, and rainfall trends are more along the lines of climate stress. And so people then are making a decision of when do they cut their losses in, in the rural location that is slowly losing agricultural productivity. Um, and I think it's really interesting. You can actually look at a lot of this data. Um, FAO, uh, G-A-E-Z, uh, has great data on predicting agricultural yields um, across different crops in different locations around the world. Um, and so you can kind of use this data to say, well, what will will uh, climate de climate change in the form of land degradation and climate stress look like uh, on crop yields and kind of build a model from there thinking about what um, productivities and, and output will look like in the in places of origin. Um, Melody, do you yeah. want to? And it's, yeah, let me jump in and think about the second one. So I think the second one, thinking about, you know, lots and lots of countries now, half of the world's thinking about, especially countries in sub-Saharan Africa, half of the population is below 18, or there's a very large number of folks who are like young. Well, I think, what does that mean? So what do we learn already from papers that we see? We see that young people tend to be more mobile. So if we look at who tends to migrate, the people that are migrating tend to be young people. So having a larger share of your population who is young, maybe that means that that country might be more responsive in terms of how many people might try and migrate. However, in many locations, there's also many countries have a really big youth unemployment um, challenge. And so we also know that high numbers of unemployed youth may gen tend to spill over into other um, areas. So for example, there's evidence thinking about unemployment rates leading, for example, to participation in crime, participation in violence. Do we think a little bit about areas where there might be increased tendencies when there's more economic uh, stress and there's large people, numbers of people who are already unemployed? Is that going to be something that makes these congestion effects in the city potentially larger because they're going to be a little bit more sensitive? So I think on the migration side, um, you know, it, it's really interesting to think, yeah, what does a population who's more mobile, younger, what do we want to think about in terms of these elasticities of how likely is someone to try and move away when um, when they have a bad shock? And so, for example, one of the projects that we're working on is 
an evaluation of seasonal migration H2A programs between Mexico and the US. These are sort of guest worker programs. Their workers um, sort of mostly are in their 20s and their 30s. Um, these, are, these are really programs where mostly men, young men are the ones who are migrating. People who are a little older, who are more settled with kids and families do migrate, but they tend to migrate at much lower rates. So I think it's really interesting to think about the demographic uh, composition of both rural and urban locations, and then think about how that might interact with how flexible are people's desires to move? How likely are they gonna be able to respond either to negative uh, spillover effects or to wage effects? You know, is there opportunities for thinking about training if you're switching sectors and all of these different things? And again, that's something on the external validity to come back and just understand, you know, maybe we're estimating migration elasticities from the US, which has a much larger or much older population, we might want to think about those for the area that we're trying to predict uh, a little more carefully. So great question. Great. We'll swing back now to the live uh, participants. Are there any more questions here? If not, we have plenty in the chat we can pick from. Nope. Okay. That's okay. Um, there's a few questions in the chat about limited data. Uh, specifically how migration models are affected or limited by data availability and resolution. And another one linking that more to um, informal settlements and informal work uh, and how we can perhaps capture that in models. Yeah, so data availability is the age old problem of many development economists, which is why so much so many development economists turn to field work and collect their own data. Um, so I think, you know, as much as you can, uh, you know, look towards that, I think there's a huge opportunity there to, to fill in the gaps that do, are existing from a lack of data. Um, you know, um, my my work is, is around refugee info refugee integration um, in Jordan from Syrian refugees and I data availability is a huge challenge. So I think it's you know always something you have to you know grapple with. And I know that for example, um, part of the reason that the uh, Melanie and Garrett's paper on um, internal migration chose Indonesia was because of data availability. So I think you know data does determine a lot of the the, the types of questions you can ask and the feasibility of these questions. Um, but also give you gives you a really nice opportunity to go and collect your own data. Yeah, and I think um, one of the other things that I think is really interesting is to think about kind of this both the collecting the data angle, which is great, often really difficult, really hard to do, costs a lot of money. But there's also just been an explosion in things like you know using cell phones for tracking purposes. So thinking about integration, for example, of refugees. You can often see people cross borders with cell phones. You can see how those cell phones move around new locations. Um, you can see, for example, within a country, if there is a shock in one area, what happens to the migration of cell phones. And that gives you massive the sort of trade-off. You don't often know exactly the characteristics of who owns the cell phone, but you just have really large numbers of flows that give you a really good sense. So I think Lots of um, policy uses cell phone tracking after natural responses to get a good sense of like, what's the displacement? I think there's really exciting work looking at integration of refugees, thinking about sort of what and which patterns do cell phones pass through the day. Um, and I think this is a, another area where, you know, data availability is often um, on, the, on the climate side, there's a lot of data availability, a very geographically disaggregated thing. The piece that's kind of tricky is getting the data on like migration flows. And I think part of the question, if I was reading the question right, um, is also just about like, does it matter if you're thinking about disaggregated or more uh, less disaggregated regions? And I think there, um, for example, like how likely are people to migrate distances that are short versus long? You wanna think about, do you have the right data to be able to pinpoint where people are, where people go to and get those elasticities. Often the elasticities of migration to distance don't, aren't too different if you use a more aggregated or disaggregated version. Um, but again, you could think a little bit about, you know, what's the units? Could you do some robustness if you have some choice to aggregate it up and just check how stable your uh, elasticity parameter is that you're using? Uh, so, and picking, yeah. picking off of Melanie to answer the second question around informal uh, labor and informal settlement. I think, you know, we have to get creative with data as well. I mean, there's a, a huge use of satellite data now to, to measure, you know, things like flooding and climate shocks. Um, you can even see some settlements depending on how big they become um, through like Google Maps and things like that. 
Um, there's a lot of, you know, opportunity. And I know the International Organization of Migration does a lot of um, data work on flows of, of maybe not a, a just as a precise disaggregated location as maybe people want, but they are starting to really look at flows, particularly of um, trans pastoralist uh, populations in Sub-Saharan Africa, migrants, uh, refugees, to try and get at some of these informal flows. Um, and I think informal work is is maybe less of, you know, there's informal work in the developed world is going to be harder to measure um, actually than the inform in, than in the developing world because so many people are, are working informally. And so, you know, labor force surveys actually do often, you know, capture these people if they're, they're done decently well. Um, and so using also data that's been collected by other academics is a huge way to um, leverage the hard work and the money that's already been sunk in to collecting really high quality data. Thanks. I know that's something that we run across a lot. So good to good to speak to it a bit. Um, Yu Ching, did you have a question as well? Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm thinking about the, this question in the outside uh, our, our angle. For example, what is the impact of the uh, migration? It may affect the environment, for example. So people may decide to move and uh, th th their decision is always lagged. Uh, they uh, they decide based on the uh, past information they received, uh, but uh, currently the situation might be changing, especially in the in the like nature disasters. Uh, and do, after the uh, earthquake, people may go out very quickly, and uh, some places might be a good choice for them to go, but it becomes very quickly uh, overcrowded, and people may decide to go in other places. It might be a, another angle of the congestion what would, would there be any research on it and uh, how can i design for example for this kind of research and and another angle to think about the impact of immigration it might be uh, that uh, people's uh, attitudes to the political attitudes uh, uh, environmental attitudes might be changed uh, after some immigrants goes into this country for example these people uh, believe some kind of the re religions and 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 like the Buddhists and all the, they are all Muslims and uh, after they uh, go into this country, the the, the whole country may change in their uh, at, uh, attitudes to the this religion and uh, to many other political uh, issues and like their their political opinions will change. Uh, would there be any thinkings from from you? Thank you. So I feel like there are kind of two questions there, one around uh, congestion forces in a really short time horizon, and then another around the political economy concerns. Um, I think with congestion, I think the model, as Garrett said, is based on assumptions that the parameters of congestion are, are fixed and, uh, and follow the long run. And, um, you know, as he said, that the whole reason he pulled out the war of the world was because he said, ah, we don't have a good, we don't have a good counterfactual for what what it looks like to have mass arrival of of um, climate refugees in a short time period. So I think, you know, looking at this sort of data where you do it at maybe not the global scale, but you do it at a local, uh, much smaller disaggregation and you look at, you know, in response to something like an earthquake or a, a massive flood, like how people reallocate and maybe try and estimate the, the congestion costs there. And I think that'd be very interesting. Um, to the political economy question, Garrett did cite a couple of papers that start to talk about these sorts of issues. Um, there's one, and I'm blanking on the author, so I apologize, um, but you can check the reading list that's been published. Um, one looking at how in Denmark there are a trend towards more right-wing views in the, in the presence of migrants, uh, and another in India uh, where they look at basically politicians' willingness to help migrants versus um, local populations. Um, so I think there is starting to be literature on uh, the political economy side of migrant arrival. Um, of course, you know, there's always room for more. Uh, and I think with the with the congestion, I think that's a kind of thinking about these parameters and changes in elasticity under these more extreme cases are, is going to be a really interesting area of research. Yeah, and I think maybe the first one, like thinking a little bit about natural disasters, like. Um, you know, I think your question also talked a little bit about like very immediate short run effects versus longer run effects. 
And I think um, not all of the spatial models are geared up for the first one, like very short run effects. And I think people tend to have, you know, there's an immediate crisis, people in the short run tend to be generally flexible and accommodating. Um, and I think often the challenges are like once the crisis is, the immediacy of the crisis is removed and maybe some of the migrants that came end up being a more permanent um, permanent migrants in the city, then there's like changes in, for example, political uh, opinion. So I think there it's quite interesting to think about what goes on. I wanted to flag, we have a different, at Stanford, there's a macro job market candidate this year, Shifra Arandin, who has a really interesting um, paper on thinking about hurricanes in Puerto Rico. She sort of shows that there's like an immediate response folks can move to the US there legally. There's an immediate migration response, but over time, about half the people end up actually coming back. So there is both um, sort of temporary migration that goes, folks go out um, to remove from uh, the shock, but then over time come back, but you know, not everyone um, ends up moving back. And so I think that's kind of the piece where, again, what do we learn from these studies at different timelines? How many of those give us elasticities that we want to put into something that's a slower, longer moving process like climate change? And then how many of those sort of challenges might we want to think about as slightly different models um, for thinking about short run, medium run, long run uh, impacts? A great question. Thank you for that thank question. You. And thank you for all your questions. I wish we had more time. Um, especially thank you to Melanie and Garrett and Sarah for your time and uh, help uh, and helping to dive into this brilliant topic. Um, just a reminder that next week, We'll have Rohini Pandey and Nicholas Ryan, both from Yale, uh, speak on regulation and pollution. Same time, same place. Um, so until then, thank you all. <laughs>